Well, and I said, um, we, we really should talk. Because, you know, it's just in case Russ ends up mad at us. And it's not going to happen too much. You guys ready to praise the Lord? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Let's do it. Let's praise the Lord.
Is there anything ordinary in your life today? Are you satisfied with that? You and him can change ordinary into extraordinary. Fresh your dentures, especially if you have to wear dentures. <laughs> Last one, and then we're going to jump into some awesome, awesome word of teaching tonight. You, you need the goose gooey, gooey feelings, and man, I love those, I get those. Less and less, the more words you've got wrapped around your heart. He'll still give you the other things, but the word, the word, the word, the word. Did I mention the word? What word did you get up on this morning? What word are you walking on tonight? What word are you going to bet on tonight? The word will give you understanding. The word will create what's under you that you're standing on. Do you get that? The you word. Are welcome here. You are welcome here. Spirit of the Lord. You are welcome. Here. The word is more real than even where you're standing. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. The word is so secure because it's eternal. When you're standing on eternal, earthly things don't matter. Spirit of 
Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever had somebody fight you so hard over so little? You ever been there before? Somebody just given you Hades a mile over the littlest thing. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm the only one fighting the good fight of faith over a church of about 20 people today, which in most people's eyes is not that much. Uh, the average church is 70 to 80 members. You have to have eight members to be called a church, according to whoever's statistics. And when I was standing up here this morning, the Holy Spirit was like, 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. And I was like, okay, what does that have to do with anything about what I'm about to preach? And then again tonight, he reminded me of it. And we're going to go to that verse in a minute. But before we get to 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, I want you to turn to Luke 16 and 10. And we're going to read something you've probably heard, but uh, maybe not like the way we're going to talk about it tonight. And as you're turning there, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Father, thank you so very much for the opportunity to hear this word, to grow, to bear fruit in our lives, 30, 60, and 100 fold that which is sown in real tangible, measurable ways. We ask you, Lord, to do Ephesians 3.20 in our midst tonight, that you, Father, would do exceeding abundantly, above and beyond anything that we could ask or think or dream, according to the power at work within us. Lord, I break a spirit of rebellion and pride over every person that you spoke to come to service tonight, and they didn't. Father, for their own benefit, I pray that they would not yield to anything but a spirit of humility throughout the rest of this week. I pray that anything that they've missed out on tonight would be made up to them. Times seven, that's what was stolen from them. And we thank you for this, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I saw some faces just then. The Spirit of God said to pray that, so I prayed that. Um, anyway. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, but we're here and we're hungry. You have to be hungry to be here on a Sunday night in the middle of the summer. You got to be hungry. And you know what? God pours out the best when you least expect it. In, first, uh, in Luke 16 and 10, the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And you know that when I was reading this late, late last night, the Spirit of God said, Eric, there's a lot of emphasis on the little. You know, we talk about the verse that says, despise not the day of small beginnings. You know, we've used that verse. Lots of people use that verse. But what he said, Eric, what the emphasis is in this verse is on the faithfulness, not the little. And he says, if you'll emphasize the faithfulness, you'll start to see some things you've never seen before. And that's why I started this off with, have you ever had somebody fight you so hard over so little? Well, if you look at it in the light of this verse, it makes perfect sense. Because the fight is not over your little. What is the fight over? Your faithfulness. Lindsay's been a little Leonardo da Vinci over here painting antique furniture and just making it look all, all right and nice. And, you know, it can get real tedious. I mean, probably the first couple pieces was exciting. Maybe hadn't painted in a while. But after that tower right there, man, that thing probably got pretty old. And now it's not so much excitement, but it's more like drudgery or boredom. We're like, oh gosh, somebody come do this for me. You know, I don't believe all of that is just in her. 
I believe that the enemy is fighting over that piece of furniture right there. And why is he fighting her so hard over a piece of 1970s disco furniture? Because he's trying to steal her faithfulness. Because the Lord knows that to the degree that she paints this furniture will be to the degree that she can be handled ruling over something mega. If you look up that word much, it, it, it tells you it's not just, it, it's, it seems disproportionate to the little that you are faithful over. It really is. It's, it's like you're faithful over five people and the Lord says, okay, well, the way you are over five people is how you'll be over 500 or 5,000. So here, have them. And so there's a fight over your faithfulness. And then the title of tonight's message is how to take ownership of your stewardship. Make no mistake, God is the owner of everything on earth. He's the owner of heaven, he's the owner of earth, he's the owner of you, he's the owner of... There isn't anything that wasn't made that wasn't made by him, for him, and through him. He is the owner. But he, Adam, he handed Adam this earth 6,000 years ago and said, take dominion over it. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue this earth. David said in the Psalms that God has given the earth to the children of men. But we are not owners of this earth. And certain uh, cultures are anointed to teach us certain truths. And I think the native culture is anointed to teach us stewardship of the earth. I think you can get to an extreme and be a tree hugger. And that's not what we're after either. But I do believe that we should be stewards of this earth. I think it's right that what you kill, you eat. I think that um, if you see a weed, you ought to pull it. If you see a piece of trash, you ought to pick it up. Because this earth is yours to steward. But I don't think you should worship it. And so maybe when I say tree hugger, I should define that. I don't think you should worship Mother Earth. There's only Father God. Not Mother Earth. But you've also been handed a stewardship in this earth. And one of the most sobering thoughts that I've ever had as a Christian is that what I'm doing today and how well I'm doing what I'm doing today is determining my eternal destiny in heaven. You see, it's not enough just to come out from among them. I tell you what, go over to 1 Corinthians 15.33. And then we'll roll back to verse 10. But the Spirit just quickened me to some things here. I want you to see something. We've taught this in seven things to do about the devil. We've taught it in, taught it in dating. We've taught it in you know, your intimate relations with people, the last voice in your ear at night. But it applies into this stewardship thing that we're talking about tonight. If you'll read it all the way through the end of the chapter with me. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Or another translation says, bad company corrupts good morals. You become like you hang around with. He says, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In other words, I'm shaming you because you know you shouldn't be intimately involved with the people that don't know God. You're to be a light to them. You're to be a witness to them. But you're not to be intimately evolved in, in, involved with them. You're not. And then he says, why? Some man will say, well, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may have chance or of wheat of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him to every seed his own body. So he's saying, you're, you're a glorified version of me. You're a glorified, you're glory, you're my image of glory. And us intimately involved with unsaved people is like Jesus intimately involved with the devil. Because when you break it all down, you get past all the temporal stuff and you get down to the eternal essence of people, light and darkness have no fellowship. 
you can cake it over in the soulish realm, you can cake it over in the physical realm, but when it gets down to what's eternal, what's going to last, it's not going to be balanced. Now go to 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and look at this. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know what a yoke is? A yoke is when two of you are trying to go in the same direction and there's a wooden thing connecting the two of you. He's saying don't be yoked with unbelievers because you're going to the light and they can't even see the light. And so as you're trying to go forward, they're shrinking back because the darkness hates light. It won't come to the light. And so there's friction. What fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? What communion does light have with darkness? None. The answer is none. What concord has Christ with Lyle? Do you see the, the, the progression here? If we can just be humble enough to call a spade a spade, we can say, I'm Christ, they're the devil. It doesn't mean I hate them. It doesn't mean I'm mean to them. It just means I'm making an honest assessment. I used to be the devil, and now I'm not. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? They worship idols. You're supposed to be worshiping God. For you are the temple of the living God. And it's like letting the devil in the temple when we yoke up with unbelievers. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now here's the point I wanted to make. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. But, but now notice it's not until. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. But you see, that doesn't come until we've come out from among them. But I think that we leave it there, and we make it so small-minded as to what he's saying. I don't think he's just saying, hey, don't have a bunch of lost friends that you go hang out with all the time and you're intimately involved with. I think what he's saying is, don't be so tied to this earth that you forget that how you're behaving right now today is determining your job in heaven. If I can't trust you to be my witness in this earth, if I can't trust you to bring your friends to Christ, to bring your, your, your people to church, if I can't trust you to reach out in your community and be my light, then you know what? You're going to be a janitor for me in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm not really into sweeping floors in heaven. That's not going to be my, my thing. You know, I'm, I'm doing enough of that down here. If you go over to 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, I want you to see something. I mean, this just hit me like a ton of bricks today. We were watching um, a movie recently about how people were reaching out in their communities and, and these different things, and this just kept coming back to me over and over and over and over again. What are we doing on purpose for Jesus? 1 Corinthians 15 and says, but 10 but says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. So that means that God gives grace to people and he does it in vain. Why? Because they're not a steward. Have you ever had God forgive you of this huge thing? And then all of a sudden, you just, you're doing nothing with that. You ever been there? You ever been totally forgiven of something and just kind of squandered your relief? Maybe God gave you $20 to uh, go get groceries and you went to the movies. Well, the movie's good for about two hours, but then you're going to get hungry afterwards. And so you got grace for food, but then you squandered it on entertainment. It's, 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 it's called eating the icing first, eating your ice cream and eating your dessert first. God is pouring out his grace upon us. Every day, we don't have to pay a debt that we couldn't afford to pay. And that's the debt that Christ paid for us. Every day, we should have to die for our sin, but we don't have to because Christ died once for all of us. And yet there will be people that will pass our, our lives today. We'll never tell them about the grace that God's given us. You know, when I, when I got up this morning, the Holy Spirit met me and he says, apostolic signs and wonders today. And I was like, 
In other words, I don't get to preach the sermon I was up till 3 a.m. last night on, right? <laughs> That's his loving way of saying, yeah, you work till 3 a.m., but we ain't preaching it this morning. No, that was him saying, Eric, we're going to cause an arm and a leg to grow today. We're going to cause steel and metal in a person's body to disappear today. Yeah, that's what we're going to do today. Well, I have a choice to make. Am I going to force my message, which he gave me anyway, or am I going to do what he said to do? Am I going to shrink back because I don't know these folks? Or am I going to obey God? Today, you'll meet five or ten people. You'll talk to five or ten people. You'll think of five or ten people. Some will know God, some won't. But the question is, is what are we doing to find out the answer to it? There'll be people walking up and down the street. I can tell you right now, had, that, had the people that came this morning not come, about an hour into this morning's message, I was going to take all those waters, and we were going to spend the second half of the message handing out waters outside our building, praying with the people that walked up and down the street. Had I gotten my way this morning, that's how service would have went. We, we may still do it yet. It's still early. But we've got to get outside ourselves. What are we doing to follow up with the ones that are coming? What are we doing to follow up with the ones that are getting these healings? I, I can't understand you know, in, in my small mind, maybe is the way to say it, and my thing is that if I come somewhere, I, I met a guy just a few minutes, I re-met a guy who came here, um, I think it was Easter, and he, he walked in, never been here before, and the Spirit of God said he has a leg shorter than the other. Tell him to come up, show it, then tell him to sit back down. At the end of the service, his leg will have grown during the service. I don't know about you, but if that happened to me anywhere, I would be here every time the doors were open. I can't tell you what goes on inside the human heart. So I asked him today, I said, when am I going to see you next? He's, oh yeah, I'm coming soon. I said, well, I'll be holding my breath on that one. Sometimes you just have to shock people into their lethargy, out of their lethargy. And if he never comes, at least he'll come somewhere. But now he knows someone's eye is on him. I use my influence to help him find a place to stay, get a place to stay. And have, I thought he left town. Hadn't seen him since. And then I saw him today. There are too many people coming through our doors that are tending to go out the back door. What are we doing to contact them, to call them, to go visit them, to ask them the coffee, ask them the lunch? Within 24 to 48 hours, we should be contacting them. Not just me. Not just Lindsay sending a text. But each of us, Gassim, you've been here long enough that the person that you saw me talking to today, you should be dragging him to church every time the doors are open. You're a veteran now. Two weeks, you're a veteran. It's time to pick it up. And then anybody else you can find on the way here. You've been here two weeks, you're good to go. We've got to get back to our door knocking on Saturdays. I was so tired this Saturday. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Those little three kids, that's something else, watching those kids. That was, uh, yeah, that was an adrenaline rush for about 35 minutes. And then after that, I felt like somebody was dragging me through broken glass. But you do what you got to do, right? But we've got to get outside of ourselves. This is what Paul said, and this is what's so humbling about what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So if I'm reading this correctly, Paul had more grace poured out upon him than any other single Christian besides Jesus. But what did he do with it? Did he, did he live by his gift? Did he just show up, hey, I'm Paul? blow on them and then they all fall over. No, you know what he says? Even though I had more grace poured out upon me than anyone human has since Jesus or since, I worked harder because of it than anyone else. He not only had the talent, but he had the character to go with it. So I'm reading that and I'm going, pow, we grow arms and legs. 
but are we working our arms and legs off? Are we praying like it all depends on God? And are we working like it all depends on us? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. What are we doing with the grace that he's poured out upon the anchor church? There's not one of us in here that wouldn't yawn if we saw arms and legs growing everywhere. Because we've seen it. We've done it. We know it. It should happen. It, it, we don't even remember what it was like when it wasn't happening. Don't even remember those days. Dogs no longer having seizures. Dogs that were crippled now walking. We don't even remember what days were like when we weren't doing that. But now the question is, what can we do to make it happen more often? Well, it's going to take people. We're going to have to get out and go touch people in the ways that we've not, because you know what we have today? The fruit of what we did yesterday. That's what we have today. And to think that next week's going to be any different than this past week, and yet we do no changing, is the definition of insanity. We, each of us, go home and call somebody tonight and just talk to them, build value in them, and then show them, hey, we're a team, we're a family. Why don't you come on back? Why is it that one person I'm thinking of doesn't come to church unless the other person comes with them? And they've had the greater miracle. I would walk if I had to get, I've done that. I've walked six miles to church to get there. So then that means we've got to pray too. We have to pray hunger in the people's hearts because they evidently are getting the grace, the cotton candy, that refusing to eat their green beans. We've got to pray they decide to eat their green beans, which means we have to grow. We have to realize, you know what? I got needs. What about me, pastor? I'm here. I know. I know. But see, you're, you're like my firstborn. We'll get to your stuff later. Right now, we've got to get to these youngins. We've got to get to the little brothers and the little sisters, the ones that, that can't do for themselves. And I guarantee you, God will take care of every single thing that concerns you. That is the secret, to get so lost in others' problems that you forget your own. And then you look up one day and go, dang, all my problems got solved. I didn't, well, oh, okay, well, I like this. That is the secret. That is the key. That is Matthew 6, seeking him first. And all these things that you need are added unto you. If everyone was looking after everyone, no one would be concerned about themselves. Everyone would be touched. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. I want to show you something else. But you know, the flesh, it just dies so hard. It wants to be pampered and catered and coddled and cuddled. And I want my lollipop. And yeah, there's times for comfort. And yeah, there's times for peace. Absolutely. Ephesians chapter 4. But if you go to verse 11 and you read through, you're going to see some things that maybe you haven't seen before. In the Bible, there are what's called the unholy commas. There's two unholy commas. They're unholy because they send a mixed message. They send the wrong message. One of them is in Ephesians 4.11. And it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It sounds like the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist has a threefold job description or a calling description, but nothing could be further from the truth. But there is an unholy comma in these verses that was not, that should not have been put in there by the translators and has since been removed in the newer versions. Instead of for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ, colon, it should say, God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the maturing or the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, comma. Do you see how different that reads? For the edifying of the body of Christ. My personal job description is to mature you for you to do the work of the ministry. That is my work. That is my ministry. That's why in the book of Acts, when the Hebrew widows were being neglected, or, or the Greek widows were being neglected, um, they had to elect seven deacons to handle that business. And Peter said, it is not profitable for us to leave the word in prayer to go wait tables. 
you choose you seven men, full of the Holy Ghost, wise and of a good report, that we may appoint over this business. They didn't even choose the seven men. We're going to stay in the Word. We're going to stay in prayer. What you need from us is the Word in prayer. What you need for you is to go find seven people to help you do what you're, you're needing done. But most churches run the other way around. Pastor, uh, so-and-so is being neglected. What are you going to do about it? And then you go run and put out a fire. And that's why pastors die at 40 and 50 and 60, because their congregations kill them. But we're teaching it differently, because I believe in you. I believe that you are Jesus' dynamite stick. I believe that you are powder explosions waiting to happen on people's lives. And I believe that you're able to step outside of yourselves at any given moment of any given day and change somebody for forever. And they want to follow you in here like the Pied Piper so that they can see what a real family looks like, what a real anointed church looks like with anointed people flowing in the Holy Ghost, angelic interventions, signs and wonders and miracles. We get more out of everyone that walks through that door than any place I know of. We just need more people walking through that door. But they're not just going to come because magic fairy dust is sprinkled on them in the night. And evidently, even if God tells you in the morning to come, that doesn't mean come tonight. And maybe it just means come once. Obviously, that's not what the Word teaches. But I'm not even going to try to unravel that theology. We have to get out there. We have to go to the guy we would never talk to, and we have to go talk to him. We have to go to the person that we think hates our guts, we have to go talk to him. We have to go talk to the people that we see every day and know they're not going to listen, and we have to determine, you know what, they're going to listen. We have to go to the one and say, well, they wouldn't come, and we're going to have to go and believe they're going to come. We're going to have to get up of our own accord and just go door knocking just because. We have... On average in America, 80 years. The average American is 78 to 80 years old when they die. I can't imagine that in that time frame that we would live and die, rarely if ever win anyone to Jesus, and rarely if ever die to our comfort zones such a death that we transform into what people are nervous to be around, which is a radical witness for Jesus Christ. I have to believe that God is saying to us, come out of your shell, come out from among them. Who are them? The normal Christian. Come out from among the normal Christian, and I will be a new type of father to you. I have to believe that that's what he's saying. For this church to even have a purpose and to even flourish, why is this church even necessary in this community if it's not to be the new normal? Otherwise, why do they even need us? They already have what they've always had. Why need another church? How can we justify this place if we aren't establishing the new normal? It goes on to say in verse 13, till we all come into the unity of the faith. So what breeds unity? Me empowering you to do the work of the ministry. Are you going to see me doing the work of the ministry? Yes, you are. But I believe that LaRue has her own ministry. I believe that Zach has his own ministry. I believe Kendra has her own ministry. I believe Gassim has his own ministry. I believe Lindsay has her own ministry. I believe each of you have a sphere I could never touch with a 10-foot pole. I'm too southern, I'm too tall, I'm too dark, I'm too this, I'm too that. I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm too theological. I don't say it's small enough and plain enough. There's always a reason why I don't have the sphere that you have. But the question is, is are you owning your stewardship? To take ownership of a stewardship means just to be all in. And what does it mean to be all in? To be all in means you can put me on a cross and crucify me, and so what? Jesus turned to his disciples after he told them that if they don't drink his blood and they don't eat his flesh, they have no part in him. And almost everyone left him when he said those words. They thought he was talking about cannibalism. 
And then he turned to the ones that did remain and instead of going, thank you guys for not leaving, you know what he said? You gonna leave too? That's what he said. Is you gonna leave too? And Peter said, where are we gonna go? You have the words of life. See, this thing is not as fragile as we make it out to be. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. I came to set a man at variance against the members of his own family. There'll be two in a family versus three. There'll be a father against his daughter, a mother against her son. Why? Because of the name of Jesus. Does it mean you go home and punch each other out? No. It's not talking about that. But if there's friction in relationships because you're defining a new normal, praise God. Woe unto you are you when all men speak well of you. You're not doing something right if somebody isn't hating you. There's a problem if there's not friction in your life because of your faith. And I mean measurable, tangible friction. The one thing that we are called to suffer, and the Bible even says don't call it, count it suffering, count it all joy, is persecution for our faith. We have to thicken up. And we have to get out there and, and just get the first few no's out of the way. Walk up to somebody, ask them do they know Jesus, let them tell you no, and then all right, now get over all that. All right, good, we got the no's out of the way. Now, let me tell you why you should say yes, if they'll stand there and talk to you. If they won't, go to the next one. There's 100,000 extra people in this town today. 100,000. 50,000. 75,000. I guarantee you there's three, four times more than there normally are. If you don't believe me, just go to Walmart. Tonight, go to Walmart for one hour and sit in the parking lot or walk around the aisles. And, for no, and not, you're not there to shop, and if you do, you do. But just pray in tongues. And say, Holy Ghost, there is somebody in this store tonight that needs a word from you. I'm the guy. I'm the gal. Now you point me to the one. And just walk up on them and figure out a way to open a conversation with them. If they're in the greeting card section, kind of get close to them. They're not watching you anyway. There's no hidden cameras. And then you they get their hand on something and go, man, what a nice day we're having today. And you reach for a card of you. They're going to talk to you. And since the Lord's already told you they're the one that needs a word, all you've got to do is figure out what that word is. Just keep the conversation going. It isn't rocket science. It's so easy little children could do it. You've seen little children on the playground. They don't know each other. And they'll have a ball, and they'll walk up, and they'll go, hi. And they'll just start throwing playing ball. They didn't give each other social security numbers, credit reports, and do background checks. But you've got to think outside yourself. You've got to think outside your box. You can't expect different and do same. If we were ever going to fill this place up the way we've been going, it would have happened since September. Okay, well, we need to do special events, but we're not going to do special events every week. We've got to get outside of ourselves individually, and we've got to say, there are people in this city that are my stewardship. I've got to go find them, and then I've got to latch myself and attach myself, and I've got to go discover why I'm called to steward them, how I'm called to steward them. Steward them. I've got to take ownership of this. Now your work is different. Now your family's different. Now your social life is different. When you adopt the mentality of a discipler, everything's different. When you start seeing yourself as a teacher, for by now, all of you should have been teaching, is what he said in Hebrews 5 and 12. But we've got to go back and teach these first things again. But you ought to see yourself as a discipler, as a mentor. F five months in this church, guys, is worth 15 years in any other church. And you know that. And maybe that's why God is saying, I'm, I'm holding a handful at a time in here until they see that they are capable of 100 people apiece. LaRue is capable of stewarding 100 people in the faith. Absolutely capable. She might not know it, might not even believe it yet. I know it to be true. Here comes one, so you got 99 to go. If you brought the rabbit, that'd be 98. 
more than capable of teaching 100 people what she's learned in here in September and in years past. More than capable. The question is, is does she see herself that way? Or does she still see, still see herself another way? Now, she's emerging, no doubt. No doubt. But now, it's just time to go kamikaze crazy. It's time to go ninja style. Gassim, he probably sees himself as somebody just trying to get his feet up under him. And yet the Bible says you're complete in Christ. The Bible says you're rich. And as you start acting like it, and you start focusing on who can I steward for Jesus? Who can I win to the Lord today? And not so much about what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to sleep. Didn't God take care of you? Did you do one single thing to make it happen? You pray. Yeah, real complicated. Now you've got all this time to go win everybody around here because you've got a place to lay your head and you've got food to eat. And that's your mission. The job will come. You don't need a job. You need a calling. Zach's got 15 million friends with high intelligence and IQs. What's he going to do to win them? Signs and wonders. That's how you win eggheads. Signs and wonders. Not that all his friends are eggheads. But if they all get sick, they all get sick. And so you just wait for them to get sick. I'll be right over. Lay your hand on their head, they get healed, boom, there you go. Who's this Jesus guy that healed me that I didn't think was real or I'm mad at? Well, he's the one that just touched you. I'm sure they'll give you five minutes. And if they give you five, take ten. I give you 10, take 20. But no one's going to do it for Zach. I won't, I'm not going to do it. I can't. They're not going to listen to me. He's too old. But they'll listen to Zach. But they won't listen until he starts talking. The word always comes first. The word always cuts a swath where there wasn't a path. What is it? The, the little thing there? You can, you can go on the path that everyone's taken, or you can cut your own. Cut your own path. That's what we're talking about tonight. It, it, cut a path you haven't seen yet. Cut a trail you've not been on yet. Share your faith. Lay hands on the sick. Get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Stir it up. This is called radical Christianity. Do you know that Chinese people would give their left legs to be over here in this freedom that we have? America would already be one to Jesus if 500,000 Chinese people came over from the underground church. We are, are the problem. Hunger is the problem. Not owning our stewardship is the problem. We're too easily swayed and distracted by video games and phone calls and texts and emails and Facebook and TV and, and, and our feelings and our habits and our routines. And now it's the summer and we do certain things in the summer. And, and you know, and it, it, we, we are bound to elemental earthly things. We're talking about we speak in tongues and we're free and we're delivered. You're as bound as anyone I've ever met in my whole life if you are bound to this earth. If you are unable to walk away from that stuff in a moment's notice, you are bound to it. If you can't lay it down, you are bound to it. Don't lie. Just tell the truth. I can't give up my this. You're bound. Tongue talker. You're bound. And you don't have to be bound. I like the Incredible Hulk if for no other reason. He's a normal small man until he gets angry and then the gamut is activated in his body and he rips out even his clothes. He is not bound by his clothes. <laughs> We've got to get some gamma activation inside of us. We've got to get unbound and unfettered. And it starts with deciding within yourself, that's me. I'm no longer bound by what they might think, what they might say, my name, my reputation. We've got to get unbound. If it were going to happen, it would have happened. We've got to get out beyond our normal and establish a new normal. We have to. He goes on in Ephesians 4 and he says, 
uh, till we come to the unity. We'll never be in true unity till we're all doing the work of the ministry. The knowledge of the Son of God. You want to know Jesus? Do the work of the ministry. And not just on a volunteer basis, right, Kendra? But as a minister. Until you see yourself as a minister, Gassim, you'll always be bounced to and fro. You have a call of God on your life to evangelize and share your faith. You have a call. You're going to have to replace curse words with blessing words. You're going to have to change how you talk. You're going to have to change how you think. You're going to need to get filled with the Holy Ghost to release that. And we can show you how. I walked with you on the path the other day and did it for you. And to the measure of the stature, and to a perfect man or a mature man, we're never going to grow up in God until we take on the work of the ministry. People criticize me all the time who have never led anything. They have no idea. They have no clue. I rarely, if ever, am critical of other leaders that are leading. Because if you've led anything, you know there's stuff you don't know. So why criticize? But those that have never done always find fault. Then he goes on and he says, into a, uh, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, so it, it says here that your ability to be trained and do the work of the ministry, your participation is either making you not so full of Christ, half full of Christ, or completely full of Christ. Lindsay's in a class right now. It's a great class, and it, I wish I had a board I could draw the human brain up here, uh, or excuse me, the human soul. Uh, you've got a heart, okay, the heart of man. Turn to Hebrews 4 and 12. There's a heart in the Bible. The Bible talks about the hidden man of the heart. In Hebrews 4 and 12, it defines for us what the human heart is. It's not the physical heart. It's not talking about that heart. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Bible is talking, it says the heart is the combination of your spirit and your soul. When you are born again, your spirit man comes alive. When you get Holy Ghost filled, the whole of your spirit man is overflowing with the life and nature of God. When you get born again, there are neurons from your spirit firing over into your soul at a, at a, at a level that wasn't there before. When you get Holy Ghost filled, more and more neurons from your spirit are firing over to your soul. When you start to renew your, yourself, feed your spirit, now the spirit man is firing on all phases over here to your soul. When you act on that word, now your soul is starting to look just like your spirit man. And now you're somebody who we would say is full of Jesus Christ. But you see, it doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't just happen because, well, I read a good book. I went to church. Those are good things. You need to do those things. But hunger will speed this up and cause a fire to burn between your spirit and your soul. And your soul will be filled and fused with God. And those two are firing your human body to act and to quicken and to maneuver. What am I saying? Well, it's the difference between why you will street witness to somebody and why you won't. It's the difference between why you will come call somebody up and create a meeting with them for the sole purpose of laying hands on them for healing or why you won't. You see, what happens is when we're firing over here a few neurons, the thoughts come to us. You know, you should call grandma and lay hands on her for healing. And then you get busy and you forget about it. That's somebody who's got the neurons firing over, but their soul is not infused with the spirit and the life of God because it's not registering. They're not consciously choosing to do it. Those are most Christians. The radical Christians are the ones that have the thoughts firing and they immediately act on them. And they don't care what it looks like. They don't care what they, they sound like. Nothing, nothing, nothing. 
doesn't matter. Risk is like bread for food. And we were all in the world at one time. We all know the, the adrenaline rush of doing something wrong, especially with a group of people. But yet we become Christians and it's like we just wilt like wallflowers. It's so hypocritical. We would sin for the devil without hesitation. But to get out of our comfort zone as a Christian, uh, not so much. You know, we've got to be a good guy. I'm reading a book called Wild at Heart. And it talks about the soul of a man and how society has attempted to uh, castrate him, basically. That most Christian men are just bored. You know, I can honestly say this. The last thing I am is bored. But it's because I refuse to let them castrate me. You know, I remember my first year as a Christian, I had to try out to make this semi-pro basketball team called Spirit Express. And the tryout was 21 basketball games in 10 days in the state of North Carolina. And you know who our opposition was? all the all-star prison teams in all the prisons in North Carolina. That was my tryout to make the semi-pro basketball team. And all we did at every single game was one person would share their testimony at halftime in front of the entire prison, and then another player would give an altar call. And then at halftime, hundreds of prisoners would come forward to receive Christ. A move of God. In fact, because they weren't spirit-filled and I was, so many people would respond to the altar calls I gave that they didn't think it was authentic. They thought I was making it too easy for them to get saved. And we didn't have all the counselors enough available for it. And so they finally just quit asking me to give the altar call. They let me share my testimony, but not the altar call. Now that's religion for you. When I got to the church, I, hadn't even, I didn't have a church to go to yet because I didn't grow up in church. So I didn't have a home church. I didn't know where to go. I wouldn't even know. I was just on these teams playing ball. So when it got time to settle into a church, it was then that I realized nobody witnesses. Nobody shares their faith. Nobody lays hands on the sick. Nobody gets outside of their comfort zone and does anything that would rattle a cage or startle a mind. And I, I was ashamed to find out after 2,000 years of church history the church was in the condition that it was in. I got mad at God. I said, you've got to be kidding me. After 2,000 years, this is the best you could do? You pull me into this? I'm thinking I'm going to get to build on something. And you put me into this? Jeez. You've ruined my life. You've made me miserable. I'm, I'm absolutely upset. How dare you? And I didn't want to go to church anymore because it was affecting my faith. It was making me lukewarm, but I don't do lukewarm. So mostly what it did was it got me enemies that were my brothers and sisters. And they couldn't tell you why they just disliked me. They just knew. They did. They were like, there's just something. We just know there's something. Not much has changed. But I'm going to leave this earth someday. And they'll probably talk about me after I'm gone. But since I won't physically be in their presence, you know how it'll probably go? Oh, he was such a man of God. He was so on fire for Jesus. All oh, the things, you know, la la. As if it affected them in the least. Who are we stirring up today? Who are we wild at heart for today? I mean today, I mean right now. This message will be over in a matter of minutes. And then the question remains until midnight, until the date changes, who will we righteously offend with our fire and our zeal? Not because we're trying to offend somebody, not because we're trying to make an enemy, but you're finally just giving yourself permission to be you and Jesus. And then we have service on Tuesday. 
And what's going to happen between Sunday and Tuesday? Is it going to look different Tuesday than it looks today? That is the question, isn't it? Or will it be the same, same, same? You know you're going to sleep. You know you're going to eat. You know you're going to drink. You know you're going to go to work. But what you don't know is the choices you'll make between those moments to create something new between now and Tuesday. If you go over to Luke 16 and 10 again, it says, He who is faithful, excuse me, we're just offending everyone today as best we can, my ears included. Luke 16 and 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. This word faithful means trusty. Are you trusty in a very little thing? Jesus said getting born again was an earthly thing. It wasn't even the deep heavenly riches. Who have we won to Jesus this year? These are questions we should ask ourselves. We talked about the 70,000 thoughts that we have a day. Let's say you just have 50,000. And this is June 21st. So that means there's been almost seven complete, six, yeah. July 1st, we'll start our seventh month. So we'll just say six times 50,000. That's 300,000. Wait a second, that's not right. Six times 30 is 180. So 180 times 50,000. That's 9 million thoughts that each of us has had this year. 9 million thoughts. Who have we won? Who have we seen filled with the Holy Ghost? Who have we laid hands on for healing? Who have we seen delivered from demons and demonic oppression? Who have we discipled? We've had nine million thoughts because, guys, at the end of our days, the only thing that's going with you to heaven are the answers to those eternal questions. Our jobs aren't going. Our clothes aren't going. Our food isn't going. Our cars aren't going. The only thing that's going with you to heaven are the lives that we've impacted. Nine million thoughts this summer or this year already, which means we'll have nine million more. Nine million. And were any of those thoughts from the Holy Ghost about, hey, 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 share your faith with them. And did we run past it? Hey, you hear them sniffling? Go lay hands on them. Hey, you know they look bound by demons. Why don't you get to the bottom of it? You know they need to be taught the Bible. Why don't you go over there and take them to lunch? Go knock on their door. You know they don't speak in tongues. Why don't you tell them about being filled with the Holy Ghost? Better yet, why don't you show them what being filled with the Holy Ghost is like? Gesem and I were walking down the trail. Uh, this was uh, maybe a week ago. And, you know, we get talking about stuff. And the Holy Ghost says, he needs to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm like, well, I know that. And he says, so why don't you tell him about it and then just demonstrate? I said, do you want me to speak in tongues while walking down the trail here? Well, okay, never done that before. All right. And so I spoke in tongues, didn't I? Yeah. Did you, did you freak out and run away? It's kind of neat, wasn't it? But you know that most people would, would, the thought is that, oh gosh, you speak in tongues around somebody, they're going to run off. You're supposed to have an interpretation. Do you have an interpretation? I don't know if I had an interpretation. I don't care if I had an interpretation. I did what he told me to do, speak in tongues in front of him. For all I know, I speak in Egyptian. 90,000 or 50,000 thoughts a day. One thought, speak in tongues in front of Gassim. He'll remember it his whole life. Watch, I'm going to do it again. I see carrots coming your way. Not just orange carrots, but I see nutrition coming your way. I see hear the word beta carotene and stuff like that. Yeah, I see health, food, and fitness coming your way. I do, I see that. You need that. 
I see it. I just prayed that out in tongues. Now you watch. You watch. Write it down. It'll happen. To get what you've never had, you've got to do what you've never done. Go with me to Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Can I take this jacket off? Man, I tell you, I'm about to burn up up in here. Could be the Holy Ghost. Could just be, I'm, conv I'm convicted by my own servant. Because <laughs> believe me, I'm talking to you like I'm talking to me. Golly, help me, Jesus. <clears throat> Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore. Don't you love verses that start off with Repent. It says, therefore, we stop and see what we're there for. Repent. I hope that tonight we're repenting. And that simply means a turn in our mind, a change in our mind. Guys, there is no life outside of eternal life. So anything you're doing in life that's not eternal is not really life. You're not really living. You're existing. So when all of your commun communication is soulish, well, you no wonder you're so empty. No wonder you're so unfulfilled. Because you didn't do anything eternal in any of that. I have to be so cautious around my family. Because it's very delicate, spiritual, eternal things. And yet, when I, when I am around them, I always come away, without fail, feeling emptier inside. I love them. I do anything for them. But the fact is, is that trying to talk to them about spiritual things is like trying to hug a cactus. And so if I can't sow into that soil, I'm not going to spend much time farming there, am I? And I love them. But I'm not an idiot. I'm a farmer. And I'm a successful farmer, so I'm not going to be sowing my seed in rocky soil. I don't care if I have the same last name with them. It's just not going to happen. They know who I am. They know what I stand for. I'm a click away. I'm a call away. They act like it's some hard thing. You're in Iowa. Well, last time I checked, we're in the 20 fifth century and you can Skype me if you miss me I mean if you really miss me Skype me but you're doing what you want to do and you're making excuses for the rest so don't put it all off on me me chasing you around me chasing you down you'd be glad I come to town excuse me I got a drinking problem so what am I going to do? I'm going to find places I can sow eternal seed in. I like talking to Kasim because he'll listen to me. I understand about three or four things he says. No, I can understand what he said. I've been in Africa for two months. I know what he's talking. I know what he's saying. But the fact is that I can talk to Kasim. So I like talking to him because I can invest spiritual things in him. I try to talk to somebody who's known me for 45 years, and they look at me like i got three heads. He's known me two weeks. Anything I say, he said, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Watch this. Kasim, you want some Sprite? Yes, sir. You see? So I'm going to sew that way. And the minute he stopped listening, I'm going to sew over here, which won't happen because he's going to listen. So if you're rattled today, maybe it's because you've been sewing in the wrong direction. God's a liar if he doesn't have a sphere for you to sow successfully. And in this city, in this town, he's a hypocrite and an unjust judge if he tells you to bloom where you're planted and won't allow you to bloom where you're planted. He's a liar if that's the case. And he told Jacob, don't go down to Egypt looking for a harvest. Don't go back to your past looking for a harvest. Don't be an idiot. Dwell in the land of famine and I'll give you a hundredfold return this year. See, you're basing your success on what other people are doing. I don't, you know what, when we're down in Tennessee, man, you wave at total strangers. If they don't wave at you first, you wave at them. Everybody waves at everybody. You come up here, I wave at them. Sometimes I think they're flipping me a bird. But I ain't basing that on what on they act. I'm going to be me. You be you, I'm going to be me. And you know, now people are starting to wave at me. Yeah. I go to the stores. I've got them conditioned. I was at Walmart the other day, and they said, I heard them talking, and then all of a sudden I said, have a blessed day. They said, we knew you were that guy that always comes in here and says, have a blessed day. They're having a conversation about the fact that I always say, have a blessed day. Well, that wasn't going on before I got here. And the minute they don't act right, I'm going to say, well, then have a curse day. I don't care. Take your pick. I will. 
Cut a swath that wasn't there before. Cut a path that wasn't there before. Ruin somebody's life. You, you have that right now. Now that your life has been ruined, go ruin somebody's life. You're dragging them into that church? Absolutely. You're next. Don't be jealous. Yeah, and then we got a chance to pray a dangerous prayer for somebody the other day. No, she called and asked for one. <laughs> to get what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. And it's not like you've got to go find what you've never done. Those thoughts are firing off from the Spirit over to your soul all day long. You had 12 today you didn't act on. I know it. And as I get in the word of knowledge, I can tell you what some of them are. I love that video that LaRue posted. I don't know if it was a year ago or whenever it was about the guy with glasses, got service. I wish we could show that again. We will at the end. But that's what we're talking about. When you, when you change your attitude and your perspective and you see yourself as a teacher, as a discipler, as a mentor, and not just a receiver, but a giver, now, everybody around you has needs, and man, you're the need meter because he's living in you. Jesus is in you. You are Christ. How can he say to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? He didn't say my people. He didn't say my Christians. He said, why are you persecuting me? And yet we divorce ourselves from that when it comes time to walk outside and tell somebody about Jesus. We act like that ain't so. Jesus don't see the difference between you and himself at all. When you walk out on the street, Jesus is out on the street. And last time I checked, when he walked the streets of Galilee, dead people got resurrected. Arms grew. Lost people got saved. Empty people got filled. Peter, he, Peter was so full of God, his shadow we was used to heal somebody. You ever thought about how peculiar a miracle that is? Now, we've been talking about peculiar lately. Let me tell you how peculiar that miracle is. Guess when that can happen? Nighttime. Clouds overhead. If he's facing the wrong way, God saw an opportunity, right time of day, right forecast, right guy, angle it just a little bit. Wait, Peter, Peter, look, right there, right there, watch this. And now a shadow is used to heal people. What is God wanting to do that's peculiar in your life today? What is God wanting that's absolutely out of your comfort zone, out of your mind? Who's, when's the last time somebody said to you, you're out of your mind? If they hadn't said that in a while, something's wrong. Get a t-shirt that just says, if you're wondering, yes, I am. I'm out of my mind. Leave me alone. Stay off my cloud. Faithful means trusty of persons who show themselves faithful in the transaction of business, in the execution of commands, the discharge of official duties, uh, one who kept his plighted faith, worthy of trust, that can be relied on, easily persuaded, believing, confiding, and trusting. It comes from one that means God's, one that trusts in God's promises. Are we trustworthy? Was there no one Jesus wanted to win to himself today in any of our lives? Well, not where I went. Well, maybe he told you to go to Sioux City and you didn't go to Sioux City today. Maybe he told you to go to Sioux Falls, you didn't go to Sioux Falls today. Maybe he told you to call so-and-so and you didn't call him today. There's not a day that goes by when the blood isn't dripping off of Jesus' hands and pouring out of his side and coming down the crown of his head. And they're the ones that we can scoop in here. They're the ones we want to cause to come into us. Not transfer of church memberships, people that are unteachable, weird, wacky theology, easily offended. That's not how I want to build the church. I want to build the church on lost people and people that are, that are seasoned that God brings to us for right reasons, like what we have here. We just need more of it. But we're only going to get more of it when we get outside of our comfort zones. We get outside of our, our places. Uh, we got Acts 3.19. He says, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. 
We're not more refreshed in Christ because our sins are multiplying. What are our sins? Doubt, unbelief. I don't believe they'll believe. Well, doubt your doubt. And open up the spout where the glory comes out. That'd be your mouth. And not just down south, but up here. It works. It works, it works. When you work it. Go over to uh, Luke, or excuse me, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Guys, you have friendships and you have relationships with people and you're just not going to win. You're not going to out talk them. You're not going to outwit them. You're not going to outwise them. You're just going to have to demonstrate the power of God. You're just going to have to cut through all that and be a demonstration of the power of God. Go back to Luke 19 and verse 42, and it says this, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee around and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because you knew not the time of your visitation. Luke 19, and starting at verse 42. Times of visitation. Times of refreshing. Demonstrations of the spirit and of the power. This is not reserved for Sunday nights. This is not reserved for Thursdays and Tuesdays. You are to be a living epistle of power, of refreshing, of demonstration, of visitation. You should show up in a room and have this quiet confidence that says visitations here because you walked in. Demonstrations here. Y'all's time of refreshing just got here. And if you happen upon another qualified, confident Christian, then visit them together. Demonstrate together. Two are better than one. But just go in with the idea that if I don't go, it ain't happening. And focus on you and focus on that. Show up, show out, show off in Christ. And you will change your sphere. You will change the lives of those around you. But if you're trying to blend in and be one with soulish, carnal, unsaved people, forget it, Jack. You're going to be one miserable, hot mess of a Christian. There just is no middle ground. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. I don't want to be spit out. I want him to breathe me out upon people. I want people just wanting to just receive some of my essence just so their day can be better. Miss Colleen was down in Florida, and as soon as I get up in the morning to go out, she'd jump on that bed right there and lay down because she says the mantle's on this bed. And it kept her alive for days past when she should have been alive. I want to be so full of God, people just want to rub up next to me. And be like Jesus, like, who touched me? And they'd go, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who that was. I don't know. I don't know. If I see him, I'll tell him. I want to be like that. I want people that walk up to me in the hardware store, don't know my name, and say, sir, you convict me. Who are you? Where do you come from? Which friend was this? I like him already. <laughs> Look at Zechariah chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Zechariah chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. I'm going to tell you the second unholy comma. I told you the first one. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. You can go back and look at it later. 
Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, comma, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. That's an unholy comma. Show me where in the Bible where the devil is likened unto water. I'll give you a thousand dollars. There's not a single place, but who is likened unto water? The Holy Ghost. So it should read like this. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What do floods do? They rise up, they lift up. You ever seen cars floating in a flood? But see, if you read that because pastor disaster taught you that, then you're believing the enemy to always come in like a flood and you'll live a defeated life. But if you read it the right way, he may come in, but like a flood, you're going to drown him. Deluge. We're always asking for rain. Pour out your rain. Rain don't come from the ground up no more. It comes from the top down. So don't be believing for a flood unless it's the Holy Ghost flood. Because the comma's in the wrong place. Yeah, I just took on the King James translators. What you got now? Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. For the idols have spoken vanity and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. My anger was kindled against the shepherds and I punished the goats for the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. There are visitations that God is asking to give to us. But if you don't like visitors, well, then they won't come. There has to be this holy foot of love. When someone walks in here for the first time, the second time, that has to deluge their heart. And then when they leave, you have to be thinking, how can I stalk them? Because if you get to that extreme, you might actually call them. You might go knock on their door. You might send them an email that says, I'm so glad you came to service today. And you just show them that unconditional, unmerited grace and favor and love. And they might just wind up here again. And again and again and again. But if you're waiting for me to do that, wouldn't be good. I'll do the best I can, but there's only so much. Go to Acts 15, 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Guys, I can think of five to ten people right now that we collectively and individually need to go and see how they do. Yeah, we do. We do. In fact, we could have done that in place of service tonight and it would have been all right. Go to Romans 1 and 11. Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. I love this one when you travel the road. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Impartations of his spirit. You are more than capable of imparting the spirit to everyone you meet, myself included. You are a conduit that can do it of spiritual impartations. When you walk into the room, it should hit your mind. I am here to impart. Who am I going to impart into and what am I going to impart? I mean, the first thing I can think of is laying hands on the sick. Isn't that imparting the healing anointing? Or how about somebody just having a bad day? 
Who walks into rooms and just, just starts trying to find? Everybody that comes in this store, by and large, before they leave, I'm going to ask them one question. Can I pray for you about anything? And I mean half of them that look like they want to hit me. What do I care? I'm not doing it for them and their own nasty self. I'm doing it for the God that loves them. And I guarantee you when they leave, they'll think about it. Because <laughs> they're so soulish and carnal, led around by their mind, that it takes them five minutes down the road to realize God was trying to do them a favor. So at the very least, they leave thinking good things about the anchor antiques. <clears throat> it's working pretty good. We're starting to make some sales. I heard a report the other day, somebody, I did that too, and they said, you know, the reason I didn't let him pray for me is because I was so shocked that somebody asked me if I needed prayer. Normally, I have to go ask somebody to pray for me. You know, they've come to serve. Well, they didn't come to service. They came Wednesday to be fed. I don't know they'd have come any other way. And they totally rejected the prayer when I offered it. Totally rejected it. Like I got three heads or something. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll start in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then it lists the nine spiritual gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues gift of faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles. Nine of them. By now, you should be thinking, man, when I walk into the room somewhere, I'm there to visit, refresh, impart, demonstrate, and manifest the Holy One of Israel, the Word of the living God. I'm there to teach. I'm there to disciple. I'm there to deliver. I'm there to save. I'm there to fill up that which is lacking. I am, for all intents and purposes, the righteous flood of God. When I came in, the flood began. And when you begin to see yourself that way, guess what's going to happen? The water's going to start rising. But see, if you walk around with a victim mentality or a need mentality, well, it's going to be a very dull life. I promise you that. And that's all that crucifying that goes on, that crucifying of the flesh, renewing of the mind, touchy and fretful, easily offended. No, be a dyna dynamo, be a dynamic individual. Uh, look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. We're talking about how to take ownership of your stewardship. You are a steward of the Holy Ghost if you haven't figured that out by now. You are a steward of the Word of God if you haven't figured that out by now. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's not just talking about getting born again. That's talking about manifesting the born-again, Spirit-filled life. You can sow for it. And if your life isn't a Spirit-filled life, it's because you haven't been sowing for it. If it's not been raining, it's because your cloud's not full. Get your cloud full of the Holy Ghost. I promise he'll rain. But, 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 no buts. Just do. Just sow. And if you're sowing in stony ground, then go somewhere and pray and, and rototill it with your prayers. If you're even supposed to be sowing there to begin with. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. And as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So it calls doing good unto men, sowing into the Spirit. And here's where your service gospel can come in. Feeding the sick, or the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, visiting those that are in prison, bringing those that are cast out into your house. Matthew 25, turn over there now. Matthew 25. Maybe you're not ready to be a dead raiser yet. You want that, but it's not there. Well, here's some other things that you can do. Look at Matthew 25 and verse 31.
When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed, thirsty, and we gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and we come unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Well, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now that's a true sheep. That's not a shepherd. That's a sheep. The, that's the work of the ministry. God has set an anointing in this church to do it. LaRue was walking that anointing earlier today when she brought in Sprite, Kool-Aid, mustard, some potato salad, and I thought it said chocolate icing, but I could just be having withdrawal symptoms. Kendra brought in waters, and I, I invariably will leave somebody out. But you're walking in that anointing in a measure. Not its fullest measure, because the fullest measure means you brought humans with you. And you sat them down and you fed them mustard, potato salad, Sprite, and Kool-Aid. But we're getting, in, we're getting into that anointing in a measure. And you know what, I'm going to say this. This church is open more and more hours during the day and during the week. Okay? And you don't have to have my permission to come over and feed somebody at this table. You got a lunch hour and you're tired of eating alone? Snatch you somebody, bring them over here, set them in this anointing, talk to them, feed them, preach to them, whatever, give them a book. But man, this place is yours. I mean, use it. I don't care. You know, just, if you hear me working out upstairs, they holler and say, Pastor, make sure you got your shirt on. The world ain't ready yet, okay? Sim caught me with my shirt off the other day, just about. Lord God. Not quite ready for that yet. But yeah, I mean, come, bring them, feed them. We want that. In Romans 8, 13 through 14, he says, If we live after the flesh, we'll die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, we'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So get, granted, some of the things that the Holy Ghost is trying to get us to do, we have to ask ourselves, am I really being led by the Spirit, or am I just kind of showing up and maybe leading Him around? Am I ever feeding the sick? Or the, feed, well, I guess they would eat. Am I healing the sick? Am I feeding the hungry? Am I visiting those in prison? Am I bringing the, those that are cast out in? Am I clothing the naked? Am I laying hands on the sick? Am I winning the lost? Am I delivering the bound? Am I filling the empty? Am I discipling the untaught? Or am I just kind of showing up and kind of whatever happens, happens? Or am I doing it a little, but it's not Ephesians 3.20, above and beyond anything I could ask or think or dream, according to the power at work within me? Remember, if you're going to measure the pace of your life by the average Christian, I'm going to fall asleep watching your life. I'm going to be snoring by noon. If you're going to measure your life by the pace of other people, you've got to measure it by the word. In three and a half years, Jesus changed the course of human history. Three and a half years. Henry Blackaby wrote a book called Experiencing God. He was pastoring 10 people minutes before that book took off. So, 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 so to the Spirit. And these are some of the parameters of where the Spirit would lead you. Of those 50,000 thoughts we were talking about, I have to believe that a majority of those thoughts are geared in this way. True religion is what? To visit the widow and the orphan? 
and to keep yourself unspotted from the world and to tame your mouth, tame your tongue. That's true religion. That's what the Bible says. Go to Matthew 10 and 27. And I think, in my opinion, you can take this or leave this, that I, I think that the, the key that unlocks this whole entire world that we're talking about is this key right here in Matthew 10, 27. There should come a tipping point in your Christianity in case you're wondering where you are on the path. There should come a point when you get addicted to this. When you get addicted, you're in a good place. And if you don't know what an addiction is, I'm sure we could probably help you with that. An addiction means that you'll sell everything to get your next fix. In an addiction, you'll sell your body. In an addiction, you'll do what you never thought you would do to get your fix. You see, if you're going to learn anything from an addict, you need to learn that. You need to learn that I need to be addicted to Jesus and his kingdom and his things. Because if I'm not addicted, well, you might as well stay on the porch because you can't run with the big dogs. If you're just a social drinker, if you're just a wine bibber, well... You can't run with the alcoholics. You need to be drunk on Jesus. You need to be addicted to the spirit and the word. It, people around you need to notice you have a problem. A good problem. Matthew 10, 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. He that findeth his life, verse 39, verse 39, shall lose it. See, you had some words to speak that you found in the dark, but that's not what God wants you to speak. God wants you to speak the words he gave you in the dark. He that receives you receives me, and he that receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to drink one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, you're not a prophet but a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And the drink is not just water because the context is something he told this person in the dark. So sometimes people who didn't go into the dark to get their word from God need you to go in the dark to get their word and your word. And then you go out there and you give them that word and it's like they drink a glass of cold water. So, it starts with the word. Go to Mark 4. Jesus said that the key to the kingdom, the parable that unlocks all of the kingdom, is the parable of the sower. He says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand anything about how the kingdom of heaven actually works. But if you do understand it, then you can understand everything that's going on in the kingdom. And in Mark 4, he says in verse 13, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? In other words, how can you understand anything I'm telling you? Don't you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Don't nobody understand the word? <laughs> okay, I'm the only one to sell that many. Know ye not this parable? How then we know all parables? The sower sows the word. You are a word sower. Or not. 50,000 thoughts What's a word? It's a thought with lips and a voice. Converting thoughts into words and then words into action is the path of peace in this life. And so when you convert those 50,000 thoughts with at least three-fourths of them are about other people into words, and then you turn, turn those words into the word, now you have something. Do you mean i got to walk around speaking King James English? No, nobody's telling me to walk around in King James English. Say it the way you say it. Say it the way they can understand it. But start sowing the word. And then he says, over here in verse 26, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground? Now what is the ground? It's the human heart. Maybe starting with your own heart. And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up, and he knows not how. 
Well, pastor, you know, I told someone about such and such. No, 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 no. It's not your job to figure out how it's going to work. Your job is to sow the word. Your job is to sow the spirit. Your job is to sow the word and the spirit and let God take care of the fruit and the results. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear, and when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts forth the sickle in, because the harvest is come. It's 7.46 p.m. Sunday, June 21st, 2015. We have spent the better part of an hour and a half investing how to own your stewardship, how to possess the stewardship God gave you. I want to wrap it up with this verse. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at verse... 13. We've said these verses before, but they fit perfectly right here in this context. 2 Corinthians 10 and 13. Now that you know that you are a visitation, you are an impartation, you are a demonstration, you are refreshing, you are a visitation. Now that you know that you are a sower of the Word and of the Spirit, now you need to know where to go. Verse 13 says, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you, for we are come as far as to you as also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and to not boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Go over to Acts 17 and look at verse 26 and it says this. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. So the context of this verse and the sphere verses before is that God has planted you somewhere according to the time that you were born and according to the geographic location that you're living in right now. The Bible says your times and your seasons and your geographical location were pre-appointed by the Father. That means if you're in this room tonight, you're where you're supposed to be and not where you're not. It also means you're when you're supposed to be and not when you're not. Now your flesh may be crawling, but we didn't ask your flesh anything. We didn't ask your soul anything. And then the Bible says that the reason, the outcome of being at the right place at the right time is that you have a closer walk with him. In other words, your very neighbors should be conduits for your destiny to take place. Have you ever thought about that? The people you meet on the street are anointed by God because he said he poured his spirit upon all flesh. I didn't say they'd all get saved. Lots of people have the Spirit poured out upon them and they leave out just the same. But the very people you see walking down the street are conduits to cause your destiny to come forth. The fellow that came to service this morning, he said, I saw you guys out working several times and I stopped to turn around and come back and help and each time you were already gone. That's the Holy Ghost out there in the community. That's our prayer walking taking place. We're sowing to the Spirit. 
I don't know if you know this or not, but his wife is of, of some notoriety because of a family member. You, you, you just have no idea where doors can lead to, what realms and spheres can open up. You have no idea. The, the sphere that they have, that they're appointed, you have no idea. This is exciting. This is amazing. Because the Word is the most powerful force on earth. And when you sow the Word, you have, you have made history. There's no other commodity in the earth that will get you further, faster, better, clearer, bigger than being a word sower. There's nothing on earth that you can be doing with your time, talent, and treasure to cause destiny to come faster, richer, and deeper than being a product of the word, being a sower of the word, which means you're going to have to exchange thousands of thoughts and words a day and choose these rather than yours. And it's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be weird. But it will be beautiful. And it will be first the blade, then the ear, then the full harvest. Every single time. Always and forever. And if you are faithful in sowing the word that you have, Though it be but a little, God will make you ruler over much word. And the one that rules over much word is ruling over everything. Because everything comes from the word. Everything in life was made by the word, for the word, and through the word. Everything. So if you're going to prove yourself faithful and trustworthy in any one thing in this life, friend, you must make it the Word of God. You may be an amazing physician. You may be an amazing mechanic. You may be an amazing basketball player. But there is nothing so amazing as being an amazing Word person. And a Word person is ruling over everything. Because God wor God's Word is above His own name. But you get out of it what you put into it. And if you've heard it before, well, then that's your problem. Because the word is always fresh. The word is always new. The word is always revelatory. The word, the word, the word. And so I want to end with this. Take a look. Last place. Isaiah 54 and 11. Isaiah 54 and 11 says this. O oh, thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and I will lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make your windows of agates, the gates of carbuncles, your borders of pleasant stones. All your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, and you will not fear and from terror. It will not come near you. They will go gather together, but not by me. Whoever gathers together against you will fall for your sake. I've created the smith that blows the coals in the fire and that brings forth an instrument for his work. I have permitted the waster to destroy, but no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that's risen against you in judgment, you will condemn it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Everyone that thirsts, come to the waters, and he that has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy milk and wine without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Hearken diligently unto me and eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. 
Hear and your soul shall live. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your thoughts. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and doesn't return, but it waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish that which I please. It will prosper in the thing I sent it. The word, the word, the word. The word will teach you and establish you, will bring you prosperity, will bring you health, it will bring you wisdom. It will cause you to be secure and free from oppression and terror. The word, the word, the word. If you have to peel away, <coughs> peel away. I had a prophetess give me a word uh, back in, I think it was 